the space of five days, in December 1899, the British Army was defeated three times during the Boer War. With the loss of 2,800 soldiers killed, wounded or captured, the British press dubbed these disasters Black Week. The Boer War of 1899-1902 pitted the might of the British Empire against two tiny Boer or Afrikaner republics of the Transvaal and the Orange Free State in South Africa. I have a short video that gives an overview of the Boer War, so I don't want to repeat myself for those of you who've seen it, but if you want to watch it, there's a description in the, there's a link in the description below, and uh, there's one appearing on the screen, well, about now. The war had started badly for the British, with the Boers invading their colonies of Natal and the Cape and besieging British army garrisons at Ladysmith, Kimberley and Mafeking. A British army of 50,000 landed in Cape Town, commanded by the Zulu war veteran, General Buller. Buller's original plan had been to use his whole army to advance on the Boer capitals of Bloemfontein and Pretoria, but the plight of the besieged towns forced him to divide his forces instead. Lieutenant General Methuen, the old Etonian aristocrat, was to lead a force of nearly 20,000 strong to relieve the diamond capital of Kimberley, whilst Buller himself would personally oversee the relief of Ladysmith. By the end of November, as Buller was making his way up the coast to Natal, General Lord Methuen was already marching up the railway line towards Kimberley, clearing the Boers from positions at Belmont and Graspan, although suffering 500 casualties in the process, which should have taught him something about his enemy. On the 28th of November, he had reached the Modda River and found himself up against a Boer force of 8,000. The overconfident British noble walked into an ambush carefully laid by that magnificent Boer commander, Coups de la Rey. The British soldiers were pinned down for nearly 10 hours by accurate Boer rifle fire in the hot African sun and could only withdraw under the cover of darkness, leaving 70 of their comrades dead on the battlefield behind them. General Methuen himself was among the 430 British wounded in the battle, and their losses could have been a lot higher had the Boers not opened fire prematurely. Meanwhile, the Boers, having suffered about 80 casualties of their own, including Delaray's son, who was killed, silently abandoned their positions and moved back towards the hills around Magafonstein. There was now a lull in the British war effort for nearly two weeks as the British brought up further reinforcements and had to repair the railway bridge over the Modder River, which the Boers had destroyed. As I said, the Boers had fallen back on the formidable hill at Magafonstein, and during that two-week lull, they too had received reinforcements from their, from their army besieging Kimberley, swelling the ranks of the army based at Magafonstein, commanded by General Cronier. In his 60s, Cronier was, uh, had lost some of the fighting spirit he displayed in the First Boer War in the 1880s, when the Boers had achieved notable victory over the British and restored their independence, and also at the Jameson Raid just a few years beforehand. He was, however, fortunate to have the support of General Cous de la Rey. Age 52, de la Rey had served with Cronier back in that First Boer War. Since then, he had opposed Kruger's hardline attitude towards the Eightlanders, the foreigners who settled in the Transvaal during the Gold Rush, believing that if they acted too hard on those Eightlanders, it could lead to war with Britain. A proud Boer, he had nevertheless hired an English nanny for his children. And when the war that he'd always warned, about, warned against finally broke out in October 1899, he had escorted her to the safety of British lines. De La Rey was already proving to be one of the Boers' most able and aggressive generals. It was De La Rey who had conducted the very first offensive action of the war, attacking and capturing a British troop chain destined for Mafeking. Nominally reporting into Cronia, it was actually De La Rey who had lost his son at the Modder River just two weeks beforehand, who took tactical command at Magafonstein. In the intervening two weeks since the Modder River, De La Rey had supervised the construction of an elaborate trench system on the hill, extending into the defendable landscape either side, forming a 12-mile crescent. This 12-mile wide defensive barrier effectively reduced the opportunity for the British uh, to outflank his positions. The obvious place for the Boers to position themselves was up on the hillside. After all, holding the high ground has been a military competitive advantage, well, since time immemorial. 
The only disadvantage in this particular war would be that the British artillery could pummel his positions long before his men could inflict casualties on the British infantry. And so Delaray came up with a bold plan. He ordered a 1,000 yard trench to be dug at the foot of the hill, on the level ground facing the British, adv uh, British advance. It was the last place that the British would expect to find the Boers. And in the ground in front of the trenches, he covered it with barbed wire, along which the Boers tied tin cans which would clang when the wire was touched, alerting them to any nighttime attack. Now, it was obvious to General Methuen that uh, the Boers were blocking his path to Kimberley and they were centered on the hill at Magafonstein. What he wasn't aware of was the exact Boer positions. The army coming into the Boer War had a paradigm based upon fighting ill-equipped native armies for decades beforehand. Whilst those opponents were brave, they tended to be armed with spears, swords, shields, and they attacked in vast numbers. Under those circumstances, the British infantry didn't need to have accurate rifle fire. They just needed a lot of rifle fire fired in unison into those massed ranks of their enemies. And they had mastered this, this controlled volley fire into deadly, with deadly effect, as witnessed the year before at the Battle of Omdurman in Sudan. Allied to that disciplined volley fire was a disciplined bayonet charge to storm enemy positions and to clear them. Uh, back in 1882, General Wolsey had won the Battle of Tel Al Kabir with a dawn bayonet charge on the unsuspecting Egyptians. So all their experiences at Omdurman and Tel El Kabir, at Baro in Sudan, or Lundi in the Zulu Wars, showed that these tactics worked. As long as your enemy massed up against you, and they didn't have any means of really firing back. Unfortunately for the British, the Boers were a very different kind of enemy. They didn't do massed charges against ranks of British infantry, but they concealed themselves behind boulders and in trenches. And with the latest German Mauser rifles and Krupp's artillery, they most certainly could fire back. And against the Boers, it was the British tactics of standing shoulder to shoulder, firing volleys and charging with bayonets that was to look antiquated. Because it was those tactics and that way of habitual thinking that was to prove so disastrous to the British army in Black Week 1899. Black Week had started on the 10th of December when the British were defeated at Stormberg, losing over 700 men, mainly captured. I've done a video about that battle too. And on that very same day, the 10th of December, 1899, General Methuen uh, began his advance to break through the Boer positions at Magafonstein. His plan was simple. Storm the Boer positions with a dawn attack. Unfortunately, that very same tactic had ended in disaster at Stormberg that very morning. Rather like Stormberg, Methuen had not adequately scouted ahead, meaning he didn't really know the Boer dispositions at Magafonstein. This lack of scouting was another handicap in the British army that was exposed by the Boer War. To be fair to the general, it wasn't for lack of trying. Despite the lack of skills, his mounted units had gone forward, but they'd been dri driven off by fast-moving Boer commandos. Likewise, for the previous two days, the British army had been firing at the hills, trying to force the Boers to fire back and therefore give away their positions. But the Boers held their fire. So without pinpointing the Boer guns and with limited scouting intelligence, General Methuen was not clear exactly where the, position, the Boer positions actually were. I mean, he had enough military experience to deduce the Boers were entrenched on the hill at Magafonstein. Indeed, Delaray couldn't actually hide all of those trenches, could he? And uh, what he actually did was he exposed some of his ones near the summit to sort of reinforce British thinking that they would be at the top of the hill and keeping their attention away from the base. Because that trench at the bottom of the hill was most certainly concealed. And the British had no idea that they were about to advance into a deadly ambush. So, lacking in accurate intelligence, but confident in the tried and tested methods of Britain's colonial wars, General Methuen ordered his men forward in a four-mile nighttime march. The British would attack on a seven-mile wide front. The 9th Brigade, consisting of the Northumberland Fusiliers, the Northamptons, the Loyal North Lanx, the King's Own Yorkshire Light Infantry, and the 1st Manchester Reg Regiment, would attack on the left-hand side. 
Over on the right, the attack would be delivered by the Guards Brigade, consisting of those illustrious regiments, the, the Coldstream Guards, the Grenadier Guards, and the Scots Guards. The same red-coated soldiers that modern tourists uh, see changing the guard outside Buckingham Palace. By 1899, those famous red uniforms were only for ceremonial use. The British Army had converted to khaki to provide better camouflage. Certainly the last time the British had fought the Boers, back in 1881, it was their red tunics that had made them highly vulnerable targets and had contributed to their decisive defeat at the Battle of Majuba. And in the centre, the Highland Brigade would lead the attack on Magelfontaine Hill itself. The Highland Brigade consisted of some of Britain and Scotland's finest fighting regiments. Leading the assault would be the Black Watch. Behind them were the Seaforth Highlanders, the Argyll and Sutherland Highlanders, and the Highland Light Infantry. The Highland Brigade was commanded by Major General Andy Warchope the, from the Black Watch. 53-year-old Warchop came from a wealthy mining family in Scotland. Politically ambitious, he'd actually taken on British Prime Minister uh, William Gladstone in his seat of Midlothian and nearly won it from the colossus of Victorian politics back in 1892. Just after midnight on Monday the 11th of December 1899, the Highland Brigade formed up ready for a frontal attack on the Boers, wherever they were. It was inky black and the rain was falling steadily as their commander ordered the advance. Against Warchop's better judgment, he carried out General Methuen's orders to advance in parade ground fashion. His men actually held onto ropes to keep their lines straight in the darkness. And we were to see similar tactics, of course, in the First World War. It was 4 a.m. and the very first streaks of the African dawn were appearing in the sky. The Highland Brigade started to form an extended line to the attack. The Black Watch were re wheeling to the right, the Seaforths in the centre, the Argyles to the left, with the Highland Light Infantry acting as a reserve. It was then that the kilted Highlanders got tangled in the barbed wire. Jangling tin cans alerted the Boers, and then from the left, somewhere ahead of them, a few hundred yards ahead, a single shot rang out. The Highlanders were swept by a storm of Boer rifle fire, not from up on the hillside, but from just 400 yards away, straight in front of them. Firing their smokeless Mauser rifles, the Boers, lying low on their trenches and firing on the horizontal, were almost invisible to the British attackers. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, creator of Sherlock Holmes, wrote an account shortly after the battle and claimed that 700 Highlanders were hit in the opening seven minutes of the battle. Amongst one of the very first to die was Major General Andrew Warchope. As light filled the sky, the Boers were now able to deliver even more accurate fire and the riflemen further up on the hillside joined in with them. In scenes reminiscent of the future First World War, Scottish soldiers were entangled on barbed wire and were shot to pieces by German rifles. For the next 10 hours, the Highlanders were pinned down with no food or water under the baking African sun, burning the backs of their legs be below their kilts. Despite the Coldstream Guards and the, and the Gordon Highlanders try, trying to offer some sort of support, there was no way forward for the Highland Brigade. The only respite came from when the British artillery started to actually shell the Boer positions. And as Boers took cover, small groups of Highlanders would, make a, would try and make a run back to safety. By late afternoon, the Highlanders had started a general retreat under heavy Boer fire. With his centre collapsing and with the Boer artillery finally opening up and showing their positions, <laughs> General Lord Methuen ordered a complete retreat. The battle had been a disaster for the British. Overall British casualties at the Battle of Magafonstein were 970 men killed, wounded or captured. The bulk of those casualties had befallen the Highland Brigade, who had lost 53 officers and 650 soldiers. It was one of the biggest losses suffered by the British Army in a single day's fighting since the Crimean War. The Boer losses were just 250, mainly from British artillery shelling. Kimberley remained besieged. General Methuen was shortly to be sidelined, but he remained in the field for the rest of the war. However, misfortune dogged him almost to the very end. Just one month before the war ended in 1902, he was captured in a battle by a large Boer commando force led by none other than his nemesis at Magafonstein, Kuster Larey. 
Badly injured, he was released by De La Rey and sent home uh, to Britain on a hospital ship. He continued to serve in the British Army into the First World War, and upon retirement he actually became the constable of the Tower of London, eventually dying in 1932. The brave Highland Brigade continued on active service throughout the rest of the Boer War, under the command of the legendary general Hector MacDonald. MacDonald was an, is an amazing character. He was the son of a humble crofter who rose almost to the very top of the class-ridden Victorian army. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I think his story is worth telling. Uh, maybe I should do a video on it. What do you think? Uh, put a comment below. The Boers had achieved two notable victories over the British at Stormberg and Magafonstein in the space of 24 hours. But there was still worse to come in this Black Week for the British Army. Watch out for my final video from Black Week. It's the Battle of Colenso, when Buller himself falls foul of the Boers under their young, energetic commander, Louis Botha. It's coming soon, so make sure you hit the subscribe icon below so you don't miss it. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you very soon.